Welcome to Talking Foreign Policy. I'm your host, Michael Scharf, Dean of Case Western Reserve University School of Law. In this broadcast, our expert panelists will be discussing art, diplomacy, and accountability. Joining us remotely from a studio in Washington, D.C. is Dr. Paul Williams, president of the Public International Law and Policy Group, who has been working on issues of accountability for international crimes in Syria. Good to have you on, Paul. Thanks, Mike. It's my pleasure. Here at the WCPN Idea Stream Studio in Cleveland, we are joined by Dr. Mark Ellis, the executive director of the International Bar Association, who is visiting this week from London. Mark? Wonderful to be here. Also with me in studio is Professor Bill Shabus of Middlesex University in London, a leading expert in human rights law who has served as a commissioner on two international investigative commissions. Bill? Thank you for having me. Our panelists also include Dr. Shannon French with us on the show again. She's the director of the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence and an expert at law and morality. Delighted to be here, Michael. And our final panelist is Professor Milena Stereo, Associate Dean at Cleveland Marshall College of Law, a frequent guest on our show, who is an expert at international law and policy. Thank you all for being with us today. In our first segment, we will look into one of history's great, great art disputes, the case of the so-called Elgin Marbles. You know, at the British Museum, which is just a few tube stops from Bill Shabus's office in London, millions of people every year visit a famous collection of huge marble statues that once covered the walls of the ancient Greek Parthenon. Bill, can you tell us the story of how these statues, considered the most important examples of ancient Greek art and building design, ended up in the British Museum? Sure. Well, about 1800, the British ambassador to Turkey, because Athens and Greece was still then part of the Ottoman Empire, uh, decided that he was going to start collecting these marbles off the Parthenon. He originally had a plan just to do drawings of them, but then he got greedier and he started actually just ripping them off. He uh, allegedly got permission from the Turkish government, although this is all kind of mired in the fog now of the archives and no one can find the document that actually gave him the permission to take them down. He took them all down over a period of about 10 years. He took the best of the marbles, about half of them, and shipped them to England. Originally, he was going to put them in his, his own castle somewhere in Scotland. Later, he, tried, he sold them successfully to the, to the British government, and so now they're placed in the British Museum. About half of them. There are little bits of the marbles from the Parthenon that are in other museums around the, around the world. There are a few pieces in the Louvre in Paris and in some German museums. But the bulk of them and the best part of the Parthenon is there in London. I was always struck that they call these marbles because, you know, it sounds like something small or even mid-sized, but mm -hmm. they are literally the sides of the Parthenon. Um, I, I suppose everybody in this room has been to the British Museum. Mm -hmm. They have a scale replica of the Parthenon where the real walls of the Parthenon is. And when you go up to the Acropolis in Greece, you're seeing a skeleton of the Parthenon, which used to be full, other than what Lord Elgin did, right? Well, you know, the Parthenon, which was built, of course, at the time of Pericles, um, 500 or so um, BCE, uh, has been um, gradually withering over the years. So parts of it have been destroyed in a variety of, of manners. It was converted into a church at one point, and that involved ripping out parts of it so that they could put in the religious architecture necessary for it to be a church. Then when the Ottomans took over, they converted it into a mosque, built a minaret. There were some bombs that went off there, explosions. They had used it as a, as a powder magazine. So it was in, in rough shape already when Elgin got to it, and so he was able to go in and pick off some of the pieces. And, and, and I suppose he could say, uh, well, I'm saving it for the future. Mm -hmm. Now, Bill, our radio audience can't see this, but you're wearing a T-shirt with Greek wording on it, and it's all Greek to me. I always <laughs> wanted to say that. Um, w what does it say? Well, it says in, in Greek characters, it's in the Greek language, it says the Parthenon Museum. Okay, and so I, I visited the Parthenon Museum last week, actually. I was on vacation in Greece visiting friends and went to the museum for the first time. It opened, I think, 15 years ago or more, and it, it was built by the Greek government to house the, the sculpture and the marbles on the Parthenon. Um, what they've done, in effect, is rebuilt how the marbles were on the Parthenon. It's in the, you, you see the Parthenon from the museum. It's just next to it. But they're in better condition, and then they've reassembled all the pieces together with plaster casts of the 
parts that are in the other museums, including the parts in the British Museum. So you see the original parts that remained, uh, about half of the pieces, not the best ones. You see them there in the original marble. And then you have these plaster casts that were made. They're not a great copy, I'm sure. If you go down to the gift shop in the museum, you can buy beautiful plaster copies of the <laughs> art. But I think the Greeks have intentionally left them a little bit uh, rough to, to make the point that these are not the originals and that they're, they're kind of poor copies. The originals, of course, are in London. So why is it so important for the Greek government, the Greek people, to have the return of their marbles? Well, Greece has been claiming them back literally since, they be since Greece became independent. Lord Byron, who was a great supporter of Greek independence, wrote a poem condemning Elgin's theft of the marbles at the time. And uh, Greece has regularly repeated its demand to get them. It's quite symbolic. This is the center of Greek of the great Greek classical culture, and it's very, very important for the Greeks for, for in, a, in a moral and a philosophical sense in terms of their own feeling of who they are to have those marbles there next to them, so to speak, in their capital city. And I mentioned that Lord Elgin made the argument, or the British have, that they were saving the marbles for the rest of the world. Let's turn to Shannon French our famous ethicist that's with us today. Shannon, Greece argues that since its new high-tech Acropolis Museum makes it possible to exhibit the Elgin marbles in Athens in a large exhibition space, the one that was just described to us, where they can be protected and observed by everybody who comes to visit, that Britain no longer has any excuse not to return them. Now, the British Museum has their own argument. They say, all right, it's not just about protecting them for the future. We're a better venue because we present all the cultures of the world, I guess all the places that they stole things over the years. So you can see everything in one place and we have many more visitors, so they should stay with us. As an ethicist, how do you ev evaluate those competing claims? Well, I think this is one of the uh, relatively rare cases where the ethical perspective is actually a little easier to nail down than maybe the, the legal issues involved. Uh, because I think it helps sometimes to just think in terms of what is the decent thing to do and to use a very simple analogy. If, if you heard of a village that was being overrun by some invader and you happen to be a disinterested party, but you wander in just after the invasion has happened, all the villagers have been chased out, and you saw a beautiful, very fragile vase, and you took it out of perhaps, let's give the benefit of the doubt, the desire to protect it for posterity. Uh, but then later, the villagers recover their village and they come back and they say, gosh, we really want that vase back that we would have preserved. Uh, wouldn't the decent thing to do be to return it? That that doesn't seem uh, uh, that obscure. And I understand, I personally love and respect the British Museum and enjoy going there, their argument about number of visitors. But obviously, uh, Greece is going to argue we will have visitors too, especially if you give us back the marbles. And it's not really just the British Museum. The analogy you just gave, that's repeated over and over in mm -hmm. many countries. So let me turn to Melina Stereo, our expert in international law. You know, Melina, it's a fact of history that our great museums happen to be housed in the capitals of major political and military powers who have come into possession through not entirely legitimate means. But it's also a fact that they are great museums. The British Museum, the Louvre, the Met, and similar institutions they're also part of the world's cultural heritage. So if the, Mel the Elgin marbles are forced to be returned to Greece, could this set a restitution precedent that would empty the world's greatest museums? Well, Michael, I looked into this a little bit, and it turns out that we already have a restitution precedent. So let me just give you a few examples. So in 2014, the LA-based Getty Museum actually returned to Greece a 4th century BC Macedonian gold wreath, and then also a 6th century BC marble statue of a woman. The same museum gave back uh, 500 ancient artifacts to Italy in 2001. Uh, 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 the Heidelberg, Heidelberg University of Germany gave back to Greece a small piece of the Parthenon itself, actually. And in 2008, the Vatican gave back a Parthenon fragment to Greece. So we actually have several examples of restitution taking place. Now, these uh, huge museums such as the Louvre, the Met, the British Museum, they have so many objects in there that by giving back some of them um, that perhaps are very famous, but that p perhaps also deserve to be given back, I don't think we're in any danger of emptying those museums. All right, so there is a precedent. Let's turn to Paul Williams down in Washington, D.C. Paul, you have helped negotiate a number of international disputes across the globe. Greece has been requesting the return of the Elgin marbles for over 30 years. 
Why do you think this dispute has continued for so long without resolution if all these other museums, as Milena said, are already returning their versions of the Elgin marbles? Well, Michael, I think we have to be honest here that this dispute regarding the marbles reflects a legacy and a culture of impunity for art institutions, museums, and collectors. The international law that addresses, and it's, it's important that Milena noted that this was precedent, precedent and these were decisions by these museums to return them, they weren't the result of litigation or obligations under international law. The law which governs the return of these types of antiquities is essentially based on the law of plunder, which was sanctioned during the colonial, colonial, era, colonial era. There's very difficult uh, hurdles to overcome seeking to litigate the return of antiquities, and there's huge jurisdictional problems. The Greeks have tried and contemplated litigation, and it's been completely unsuccessful. Well, so Bill Shavis, you litigate a lot of cases um, in international tribunals, in domestic tribunals, human rights cases, all kinds of things. Is there an arguable claim in a court of law somewhere that Greece can turn to, or does Greece's claim have to be resolved only in the political and diplomatic sphere? Well, you use the phrase arguable claim. There's probably enough, certainly, to pass what I call the straight face test of litigation, where you could stand up in court and make a make a, an argument that would have some legal foundation. There's a, a legal opinion that was prepared about a year ago by the British barristers uh, Jeffrey Robertson and Amal Clooney, where they set out a strategy, actually, that they proposed to the Greek government. Uh, one of them is to get a case at the International Court of Justice, the World Court, but it wouldn't be a lawsuit filed by Greece. It would have to be an advisory opinion, which would be requested by UNESCO or by the General Assembly of the United Nations. And the other is to go to the European Court of Human Rights, and Greece could take the United Kingdom to the European Court of Human Rights. But both of these have difficulties, but there's an arguable claim, and you know sometimes the threat of taking uh, a case to court with the uncertainties for both sides uh, as a way of coloring the political discussion. And that might help to turn the corner for Greece in its negotiations with the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom has been quite intransigent so far, although they've done public opinion polls in the UK and found that a great majority of uh, people in the in the United Kingdom recognize that they should go back to Greece. There's a great way to solve it all, and that's to have proper copies of mm -hmm. it made. I think the British have said, listen, you have the copies in Athens. Isn't that good enough? Well, if it's good enough for the Greeks, it should be good <laughs> enough for the British too. So why don't they keep the copies and let the Greeks have the originals back? Well, it's time for us to take a short break. When we return, we will discuss other controversies surrounding efforts at obtaining return of great works of art and artifacts throughout the world, from the Machu Picchu relics to the woman in gold to the recent, recent masterpieces found in the attics in Europe. So stay with us. Welcome back to Talking Foreign Policy brought to you by Case Western Reserve University and WCPN 90.3 Ideastream. I'm Michael Scharf, Dean of Case Western Reserve University School of Law. We've been talking about international art disputes. Our expert panel includes Mark Ellis, the Executive Director of the International Bar Association, Bill Shabis, who has served on two International Truth Commissions, Paul Williams, a former State Department official who has negotiated a number of international disputes, noted ethicist Shannon French, and international law scholar Melina Stereo. Earlier in the broadcast, we were discussing the case of the Elgin Marbles. In this segment of our program, we'll be discussing disputed ownership and the returning or keeping of other famous works of art throughout the world. Let's begin by talking about the case of the Machu Picchu artifacts. Paul Williams, down in Washington, D.C. You explored the ruins of the mystical mountaintop city in Peru just this past June. Did you see any artif artifacts while you were there, you know, pots, sculptures, carvings? Well, actually, Michael, I spent most of my time taking pictures of you posing with llamas. Um, but when I did have a uh, when I did have a moment or two to look around at the at the runes and sort of search around for some artifacts to bring home, just like Lord Elgin, um, I was unable to find any uh, because I had been beaten to it by the Yale researcher and explorer Hiram Bingham, who discovered the hidden city in 1912. 
And uh, as most folks did in those days, he brought most of what he could lift and pack away. He brought it back to the United States, and it's been with Yale up until very recently. So after years of negotiation, Yale, as you said, has recently announced that the two sides had reached an agreement. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, essentially what they've decided, there was a bit of a name and shame effort uh, on the part of Peru vis-a-vis Yale, and Yale officially recognized that Peru owned the cultural objects, which was no major concession to begin with. Uh, but then Yale did agree to return the objects to Peru so that it, and guaranteed that it had access to continue to do academic and scholarly research on those objects, and it was able to retain a number of long-term, or a number of objects uh, on a long-term loan. So would you think this is a good blueprint for resolving the Elgin marbles and other disputes? Yeah, it's actually quite uh, an impressive uh, blueprint, and I think one that should be followed by the international museums, the academic institutions that have this cultural property. One of the things is it's oftentimes, it's very clear where this cultural property has come from and, and whose culture it is, and it's certainly not the academic institutions and the museums. And coming up with some type of arrangement as the other guests have talked about vis-a-vis the Elgin marbles, where it's returned, but there's access, and maybe there's some residual element of the uh, antiquities that can be uh, remain on display at Yale or the other institutions. But basically getting the property back to its original owners, that's not only the right thing to do, it's the legal thing to do. Well, that's not always easy to figure out who the owners are, because let's talk about the cases of Nazi confiscated art. Um, which is round up in museums and even attics throughout Europe. One famous example is the case of the woman in gold. It's a painting by a Jewish, it's a painting of a Jewish woman named Adele Block Bauer, which was made by the American artist Gustav Klimt in 1907. And let's bring Mark Ellis, who's been patiently waiting to join our conversation. Mark is the executive director of the International Bar Association. Let's bring Mark into the discussion. Mark, can you tell us about this case? Michael, it's a fascinating case, and perhaps the listeners would have also had an opportunity to watch the movie Woman in Gold uh, last year with uh, Helen Marin, as you mentioned in your, your opening statement. Uh, and here was a situation where... Um, uh, uh, this famous painting was uh, was uh, was made uh, during uh, uh, and, uh, quite early, I guess, uh, and before the war. And, and the uh, Blockbauer family, a very prominent Jewish family in Vienna. Uh, but once uh, Nazi Germany took over and uh, Austria became under the rule of the Nazis, uh, the Nazi uh, uh, decided to transfer this very famous uh, painting. Uh, to uh, a museum, the National Museum in Vienna. And uh, uh, Blockbauer's niece, uh, Miss uh, Altman, Altman, had decided that actually she was, in fact, she was the heir of this, uh, of, of this painting and it belonged to uh, the family. And she began to pursue uh, the litigation that was mentioned earlier, uh, to litigate this through uh, the courts in, in Vienna and Austria. And she failed, no surprise there. She then turned her attention to pursuing this litigation in the United States. And that uh, actually ultimately uh, was successful. It, the case went all the way up to the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court on an issue dealing with, uh, with, the, uh, with the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Uh, and in the end, when she won that case at the Supreme Court, the Austrian government knew that it was in trouble. It knew that it was going to be very difficult to prevent her from uh, obtaining this painting. And something extraordinary happened. It didn't go from litigation. It went into arbitration. And she was offered an opportunity to arbitrate uh, uh, the ownership of this painting, but under two caveats. One, it would be arbitrated back in Vienna. And two, if she lost, she would be prevented from pursuing any other type of uh, litigation back in the United States. That was a big decision on her part. She made that decision. She went into Vienna. uh, It was arbitrated there. And it and she won. And that was extraordinary, I think, for a couple of reasons. One, if you have visited, those of us who have visited Vienna, I did this as early as last year, this painting still resonates with the city. It's, we talk about something symbolic. This painting is symbolic to the city of Vienna. You wouldn't know that, this, that the painting was no longer there, and yet it is now sitting in New York. So it can occur, and rightful restitution, uh, the ability to bring back property that was stolen, 
uh, to the rightful owner uh, worked in this case and was the right thing to do. Well, why can't Greece do that with the Elgin Marbles in the U.S. courts? Well, I I believe that Greece, in fact, should be able to uh, uh, should be able to uh, uh, obtain those marbles back, and I I ultimately think that's exactly what's going to what's going to happen as well. Bill, are there any procedural blocks for a country like Greece coming to U.S. court to litigate this case between it and Britain? Oh, yes, big time. I think that <laughs> if there were not, uh, someone would have done it a long time ago. I think that's a it, – it's a problem because you're, you're dealing – it's not a – it's not private litigation between an individual, some individual who stole the painting or who is in possession of it and the original owner, but you're dealing with governments. governments. And there's an immunity problem there that I think would be well-known and familiar to all international lawyers. I'm not disagreeing with Mark that there may be a way to get in there, but it's not obvious. No, and of course it wasn't obvious at the time when this case was brought up to the U.S. Supreme Court. That was a very important decision the court said about the retroactivity of, of the nature of, the, uh, of, the, of this Foreign, uh, Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. And so you know, litigation can help and law can change, uh, and, and I think this is an important important thing to remember. So more recently than that, in 2012, I think many people remember reading in the press that a treasure trove of paintings by Henri Martisse, Matisse, Pablo Picasso, Marc Chagall, and other great artists was discovered in the attic of an apartment in Munich, Germany. Mark, what has become of these priceless works of art, which were presumably stolen by the Nazis and then just stored in this attic for all those years. Yeah, another kind of fascinating story where you have uh, all of this precious art that no one knew existed what, hidden in the, in the attic of a gentleman, Mr. Uh, Gerlet. And Mr. Gerlet collected this, uh, the, the, the art. It was assumed that this art was looted, and the Austrian government authorities came in and confiscated uh, the art. But interesting, the twist was they gave it back to Mr. Gerlet with the understanding that he would assist the authorities in identifying those uh, uh, paintings uh, that, in fact, were looted, and he would assist in returning, getting these returned to... And then he died, rightful. right? And then he died. <laughs> he died soon after that agreement. Yeah. But he had uh, bequeathed uh, all of those paintings to a um, uh, to a museum in Switzerland. So now it's the Swiss, the Swiss uh, museum uh, that is undergoing this very long, arduous process uh, of trying to determine uh, which paintings, in fact, were looted, uh, taken uh, and it, illegally. And maybe even if all of them were looted, that they can't figure out who they belong to. Because unlike in the movie The Monuments Men, where you had a character keeping a log of each stolen artifact or painting, there may not be in this case. Well, I think that's always been a challenge on this. Uh, but you could saw w- w- the same situation with the woman in gold with Miss Altman, who was, in essence, the niece uh, of, of, uh, of uh, Block Brower. Um, the evidence that can be presented to, in fact, show that there was ownership is out there. There's actually a, a, an Athenian cultural association that sued the United Kingdom in the European Court of Human Rights. And just this past summer, the European Court threw out the lawsuit, said it didn't have jurisdiction because this happened 200 years ago before the court had uh, come into existence. Some of these would apply, but the problem then is that they apply to objects that have been um, illegitimately taken or stolen. And the British government has made this argument that, at least with respect to the Elgin mar- marbles, that those were not illegitimately taken, that Lord Elgin actually had permission to do this. So these conventions are great, but really only for future situations and not for the great past ones that we've been talking about. Um, Paul, even if there are claims for the return of some of these antiquities, in many cases, the individuals and institutions that purchase them also seem to have a legal right. They're innocent purchasers for value. Why should they be forced to give up artwork and antiquities that they bought in good faith. Well, Michael, you've identified a key point. You know, balancing the interests of the original owner and the good faith purchaser of stolen property can be intensely challenging. And there's two sets of rules that address this. There's the Anglo-American approach, which is essentially that stolen property is always stolen property no matter how many times it's changed hands. You, you can't cleanse the property of its illegal origin simply by passing it through uh, the chain of ownership. However, on the other hand, and probably the majority rule, there are the civil law countries which say that if you have stolen property, someone buys it, doesn't know that it's stolen property, they become a good faith purchaser, uh, 
and essentially the taint of that property being stolen has been erased. And then it can go from one good faith purchaser to another good faith purchaser, and you're not able to reclaim that property. Now, the 1995 treaty that Malena mentioned attempts to deal with this issue and essentially says that there is a right to the return of all stolen antiquities, whether they were bought in good faith or not. But the catch is that the individual who was victimized or the family that was victimized or the country must compensate. Uh Uh-oh. Do we just lose Paul Williams in Washington, D.C.? Okay, so we'll continue on until uh, we establish that link. Um, I think Paul was just saying that, do you know the end of well, I, I, I know what he was pointing out is yeah. that uh, there's a push to then compensate the people who made the good faith purchases on the argument that, that they were not at fault. They still have to return the items. And if you, again, think of that from an ethical point of view, it's quite clear. You know, if I find your stolen dog and I fall in love with it, but then you uh, you uh, make a valid claim to it, I still have to return the dog. But we all feel empathy for me. And someone might say, here, I'll pay the vet bills that you paid in that time. Or finder's fee or whatever. Something, yes. But you still have to return the dog so, to its But one of the big problems here is that these people don't know whether they're purchasing somebody else's dog or not. Right. Um, so, Melena, do you think it'd be possible to establish some kind of an international registry of works of art and stolen works of art and then to maybe require collectors to inform themselves about the registry and about which pieces uh, may be stolen as a way to solve this problem? Sure. So um, some of the bigger law enforcement agencies, such as the Interpol, the Scotland Yard, the FBI, they actually already have international databases of stolen art. But for law enforcement agencies in general, this is really low priority because although stealing artifacts, cultural objects can can shock all of us, it doesn't require the taking. It it doesn't uh, imply the taking of lives. And so when it comes to law enforcement agencies in general, um, they prefer to focus their resources and manpower on what they consider to be more serious, dangerous crimes. So we could do it, but it's just not something that's important enough to do. Sure. And let me just mention this. There's actually a commercial company based in London called the Art Loss Register, which is a computerized international database uh, which works for profit and does precisely that, establishes a registry, tries to keep track of, of, of stolen objects, and then tries to help with the restitution for a hefty fee. Uh. And the fees are based on the percentage of the value of the stolen object. So if we're dealing with a Gustav Klimt uh, painting, which is worth, let's say, $10 million, the company well, might the charge you... the gold, that was $135 Exactly. Million. And so they take something yeah. like 5%. And so that that's a very um, hefty fee. So, Paul, are you back with us from D.C.? I'm back with you okay. guys. Yeah. So... Let me ask you a follow-up. Especially in times of conflict, it's easy for cultural artifacts to be looted and smuggled from their country of origin. Um, You spent a lot of time in the Middle East uh, with your negotiating teams, so you see that firsthand. Is there anything being done to prevent the current looting in Syria and Iraq so that future repatriation efforts will not be necessary? Yeah, unfortunately, I think Milena hit the nail on the head when she had said that there's essentially this cultural impunity that's developed because, you know, antiquities, it's not really a high priority for for law enforcement. And so this sort of laissez-faire approach to basically putting an end to the illicit trade has led to a situation where the Islamic State, which is, you know, a terrorist organization, which we're all familiar with and which is, you know, targeted European uh, as well as American interest, raises anywhere from $200 million to $8 billion a year, dollars a year through the sale of conflict antiquities. You know, quite frankly, you could call these, these blood antiquities. And the problem is this, this regime that you know, allows the Elgin marble, marbles to, to stay in the United Kingdom, that is you know, occasionally there are some, some successes, is that exact same regime that the international community is now trying to apply to to ISIS to stop this trade, and they've been hugely, hugely ineffective. And so you essentially have this, these various streams of of trade or these these pathways of trade and uh, uh, antiquities and illegal antiquities now becoming pathways for a trade of conflict and blood antiquities and funding terrorist organizations that are directly interested in, uh, you know, attacking European American and uh, other citizens. So I think we're in very desperate times and we don't have a legal regime or, quite frankly, the policing regime that's up to, up to snuff to deal with it. And, and without this registry that Melania was talking about, you could literally go to an auction at Sotheby's and be buying 
items that were looted from Palmyra and other places by ISIS, right? And you could do it knowingly and get away with it. Wow. (laughs) So with that, let's take another short break. And when we return, we'll talk about international criminal responsibility for destruction of cultural objects. Stay with us. This is Michael Scharf, and we're back with Talking Foreign Policy. I'm joined today by experts in international law and diplomacy, and we've been talking about international art disputes. In this final segment of our broadcast, we'll discuss the hurdles to achieving international criminal responsibility for destroying archaeological sites and cultural artifacts. You know, in the past few years, the world has been shocked when the Taliban dynamited the 1,700-year-old giant Buddha statues carved into a mountain in Afghanistan, and when the Islamic militants destroyed historic shrines and libraries and tombs in Timbuktu, Mali, and most recently when ISIS bulldozed ancient temple complexes in Palmyra, Syria, and apparently sold the artifacts on the black market. So let's start off with our international peace negotiator, Paul Williams, who is in Washington, D.C. today. Paul, why is it important to seek individual accountability for the destruction of cultural artifacts in conflict zones? Well, Mike, this is a a very important and a very tricky question, because when you when you talk about the Buddha statutes, the shrines, the libraries, we're sort of all, you know, offended and and, and traumatized to a degree. And then when you say, right, let's seek seek accountability for the individuals who destroyed these things, and we're going to do that at the same forum where we're seeking accountability for people who've committed mass torture, mass rape, possibly genocide, crimes against humanity, folks start to argue, well, really, it's a statue, it's a library, it's cultural property, it's not mass rape, it's not mass torture. But the reality, Michael, is that most of these conflicts are about destroying the the identity, destroying the the other, be it ethnic, religious, cultural. And part of that effort to destroy the other group is oftentimes destroying their their cultural heritage. And so destroying the libraries, the shrines, the shrines, the statutes is part and parcel of, you know, the war crime of seeking to either exterminate, destroy, or severely traumatize uh, the other party to the conflict. It's also hugely important for reconciliation. A lot of these objects uh, are symbols that inspire national unity. And if they're destroyed, then when you do have an end to the conflict and you're seeking reconciliation and reunification, you don't have those cultural symbols, those indicators of national unity that people can rally behind. Instead, you have a legacy of anger, division, retaliation, revenge. So there's a huge need to prosecute uh, those who destroy cultural artifacts in conflict zones. So let's turn to Mark Ellis, the director of the International Bar Association. Mark, everything Paul says seems so obvious. So why is it only now that we are seeing a more focused effort on prosecuting the crime of destroying cultural heritage? Yeah, I think it's it's fascinating listening to this because, of course, we're trying to determine distinguish between the law, the laws that are on the book that, that should prevent this type of act. And they've existed for for hundreds of years, from the 1800s through the Geneva Conventions during the war up to, to Melina had mentioned the 1954 Hague uh, uh, Convention uh, on the Protection of Cultural Property. So it exists. But enforcing that, becoming aware of that is something different. And I think it has changed, I think, for two reasons. One, is uh, as we often talk about social media, we're we're getting more information. We're seeing this firsthand. We're not reading about it in a report later on. We're witnessing it 24 hours later, and oftentimes we're witnessing because those that are actually damaging, doing the damage, destroying cultural property, are doing so because that's part of their mm-hmm. ethos. They're filming it. They're putting it on YouTube. And so we're aware of this. And it is a massive, massive problem, as Paul Williams has just stated. And second, I think we should give credit to these emerging international criminal courts, uh, particularly with the uh, International Criminal Court for the former Yugoslavia, because they started to initiate legal uh, proceedings, uh, legal definitions within their statutes to allow this accountability aspect. So those would be the two important areas. Mark, let me ask you a personal question. When I first met you before you were 
director of the IBA, you were the director of the American Bar Association's uh, Central European Law Initiative, and you were stationed for long periods of time in Sarajevo during the war, mm-hmm. the Yugoslav conflict. Is that when you became aware of the impact of cultural destruction? Well, without doubt, uh, for me, I mean, it was a very personal journey, having lived in Yugoslavia before the war, lived there after the war, and then, as you've just indicated, uh, a time during the war. And, you know, it's interesting because Yugoslavia brought to the attention of the world this terminology of ethnic cleansing, and, and clearly we witnessed it. But for me, ethnic cleansing, I, I saw, was, a, was on a spectrum. You certainly had ethnic cleansing of people. But there's no doubt that during that war, there was ethnic cleansing of the identity of people. And that was very directed. It was very specific. And it was there to destroy the cultural aspects of a people. And by destroying their identity, uh, you would commit this additional uh, crime. And so, yes, watching that, watching museums being destroyed on purpose, uh, watching churches, uh, m- museums, all of this was, was part of the, uh, part of the, the, the direction of, of, of the war. And so that yeah, the absolutely... Great, the great bridge at Mostar. Mostar. That, yeah. uh, the, the old town of Durovnik right. that was purposely um, uh, bombed. I was sitting in Sarajevo during the time when the national... Um, a library, this great national library in Sarajevo was being bombed. It was being bombed from the hills of Sarajevo. It wasn't for any other purpose other than to destroy uh, the history of a people. That so was you, this. You mentioned the creation of the Yugoslavia Tribunal. That was the first international tribunal since Nuremberg. And you were part, as many of us in this room, of the creation of that tribunal. It's the first tribunal to actually try cases involving the destruction of cultural property. Can you tell us about some of that? Well, and I, th- Michael, that's exactly right. And it, 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 the genesis of that was was what was occurring, in fact, in Sarajevo and the former Yugoslavia during the war. Since we were seeing this directive, this directive of trying to eliminate the culture of a people, uh, when th- the UN Security Council then created. Uh, this uh, new uh, tribunal for Yugoslavia to bring to account those who have committed crimes. Uh, They specifically focused on this on this act, on this crime, based on the conventions and regulations and the declarations that came before it. And so you have within the statute of this tribunal a specific provision under war crimes that deals with this type of destruction. And the court went forward with 11 important cases that focused in this, in this area. So a very important development in international law was what occurred uh, by this particular tribunal because of the atrocities that were committed in the former Yugoslavia, both against people and property culture. But as I understand it, nobody was ever tried and convicted only for destruction of cultural property. It was a sort of an and, you know, additional count in, in these cases. Is that right? That is correct. And it's always a little bit surprising for me that that was not the case. And I think this is just the process of development in law. And that's why you now have in the International Criminal Court the first case that's focusing solely on the destruction of cultural right. heritage. Let's talk about that case. This is the case of an Islamic militant um, named Al Mahdi, who has been prosecuted for the destruction of ancient cultural sites in Timbuktu, Mali. And interestingly, Al Mahdi has entered a guilty plea. So let's go to Bill Shabus. Bill is one of the people on this planet that has written the most about the International Criminal Court and its proceedings. Um, There have been a number of commentators, Bill, who have argued that the ICC prosecutor should focus on the massacre of people rather than the destruction of property. The Almaty case seems to challenge the notion that we were talking about that property is a second-rate crime. But what do you think? Should cultural property crimes be viewed as secondary or equal to crimes such as mass rape, torture, murder, and even genocide? Michael, I, I don't think we have to get into deciding which one is more important or whether they're equal or unequal. Uh, the fact is, of course, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court has to focus on the loss of human life and crimes that involve uh, uh, violence against uh, human dignity. That said, uh, 
um, I think it's perfectly legitimate and important that the prosecutor also deals with crimes like the destruction of cultural property, as she's done in this case. It's very easy to second-guess the prosecutor, and I've been guilty of it myself on many occasions. We look at the decisions she makes. It's a very hard job. But in this, in this situation, she's picked one case. Um, it was an inexpensive trial because he pleaded guilty. He was cooperative. She's made a good point with it. I say hats off on that. Uh, on that score to, to her for doing it. I wouldn't want to see that become her obsession or the sole pr- pr- priority of the court, but uh, nothing wrong with doing it. I don't think people who say she shouldn't do it because it's not a serious enough uh, have, a, have a strong argument. You know, the, the whole concept of Timbuktu in the United States was a concept of a place that was far off and exotic. What actually did they destroy? You know, what are we talking about here? Well, the main destruction, and again, this was not this was not even a case of ethnic cleansing. This was a case of religious fundamentalism of a religious fundamentalist group that uh, disagreed with the religious practices of people in Timbuktu. They are all Muslim. They are they're debating amongst themselves about about what's the significance of these objects, which were tombs and a mosque, and that's what uh, El Mahdi uh, went and destroyed. It's all been rebuilt now. And people will quarrel about whether the rebuilding, like the bridge at Mostar, by the way, which has also been rebuilt. Nobody's proposing to rebuild the Parthenon. But sometimes we rebuild them and they're actually as good as new when it's all done. So, Malena, why is this Al Mahdi case a potentially significant precedent for the International Criminal Court and the world community? Well, sure. Bill has already um, talked about some of this. So this case um, has really allowed the International Criminal Court to um, reposition itself as a court that's relevant because this case took relatively little time, little resources. Within, you know, about two years, um, the defendant was identified, transferred to the custody of the court, and then he pled guilty, as Bill has already said, and then um, will be sentenced um, a little bit later in September of 2016. This was the first ever guilty plea by any ICC defendant. It was the first ever prosecution for the crime of destruction of cultural property. And it was the first ever Islamic militant that was prosecuted in the ICC. And al-Mahdi, not only has he pled guilty, but he has also promised to cooperate with the tribunal and to potentially lead the um, uh, prosecutor towards other potential defendants and to reveal information about other crimes. Why do you think he's doing that? Um, do you want to be a cynic about it yes. or not? People who are cynical say that, um, so when Almaty was transferred to the ICC, he was actually already imprisoned in Niger. So was, he was sort of um, sitting, uh, serving a sentence in Niger. And some have suggested that he actually thought that serving prison time at The Hague would be much more attractive than than, than sitting in a, in a Niger prison. Others have also said that Almaty was really the only available defendant or the only easily available defendant to the court that some others who had been um, involved in these crimes in Timbuktu had already fled or had died, had passed away. And so he was sort of the, the, the easy defendant. And the case, by the way, is also significant because it implied cooperation with the tribunal by not only Mali, but also Niger, where um, Almaty had been in prison. Have any of you been to the prison in Schwebingen? Sure, I've been there. I've been I there mean, too. Yes. I went there as a visitor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm sure that's what Almadi was hoping too. But um, can you describe the conditions at that prison compared to you know what the prison conditions might be in Niger? Well, there uh, of course it's a modern uh, European prison and uh, it's well ventilated and it's clean and all of this. Well, they, uh, but they have a basketball court. They, right? they have all the facilities one would TVs. expect. Oh, you're quite right. They but, have an art center where you can do art and sculptures, right? Well, it's a humane prison. They it's have what um, prison should be. Five conjugal visit sites for people to bring in. I wouldn't, you know, I, I would be careful about exaggerating. How many are there? The idea that this oh. is a <laughs> No, that this is a deluxe prison compared to what exists in Africa. Because okay. for African defendants, it's true that the sanitary issues and all of this are, are much better in The Hague than they might be in an African prison. But they're people who are very far from their families. The culture is different. The food is different. The environment is different. I, I think one could exaggerate that you know this is a paradise for an African prisoner to be taken to Northern Europe and to be fed uh, well, a, herring and a uh, gilded cage roast potatoes. Is still a cage is that <laughs> what they say? Well, Mark, uh, yeah. what I was going to say was, uh, and I agree with Melena. You can see this as in a cynical way of why he made that decision, but you can also, if you read his 
his statement in court uh, when he was found guilty, it's actually a very moving statement. I think he's he's come to the to the recognition that he he erred and he erred in a very significant way and he's asking for forgiveness he wants to change the his way he knows he's not getting out of prison anytime soon but he recognizes that he's done wrong to the people and he's asking forgiveness i thought it was a very powerful statement i would hope that we could see that but, in the future but isn't he a small fry uh, so melina the international criminal court it's a court of last resort it's a court that's only supposed to prosecute the worst of the worst mm-hmm. how does this guy fit into those requirements. Sure, so you can you can criticize this case on uh two grounds on so-called gravity and complementarity. What you're asking is complementarity, that the ICC is really not supposed to take over national prosecutions. It's only supposed to prosecute if a country is unwilling or unable to prosecute. Here, um, Almaty was already detained by um, Niger authorities. He was already in prison there. And yet when the ICC made this request to have him transferred, um, Niger said, sure, you can have him. And so we might you know, quibble about whether this case really satisfies the complementarity principle. On gravity issues, um, there's this idea that the ICC is really supposed to only look at the most serious crimes and prosecute those who are most responsible of those most serious crimes. Al-Mahdi really was not the only one involved in the destruction of these um, cultural, religious uh, uh property. There were others. And so we can we can question whether the crimes themselves are serious enough and whether Almadi really is the one most responsible for, for having done these things. Well, Bill Shabas, then, is there an argument that he's just a scapegoat? That oh, he's I the wrong person? That. I wouldn't say that. I mean, I agree with Mark uh, when, he's, when he says that the statement and the confession and everything has a ring of being genuine. Mm-hmm. Um, I, w- I found it quite compelling as well. I'll tell you what the real problem is with the prosecution of El Mahdi is that the Rome statute, the legal basis for the prosecution, it actually only deals with attacks on cultural property in the context of military engagements and battlefield, a battlefield context, which arguably was not the case in the Al Mahdi in the Al Mahdi prosecution. Now he's pleaded guilty, so those issues have not been developed. But the but problem the, with the prosecutor doesn't the court have the duty to review the guilty plea and decide that it still comes within its statute? Well, they do, and we haven't seen the judgment right. yet. Okay. We'll see if they decide to do it. But the issue wasn't raised in the hearing. Yeah. The problem is there's a great deal of destruction of cultural property. The cases have already been referred to by the Taliban and by al-Qaeda that happen when they control territory that are far from the battlefield. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was in Athens last week, I went to another museum where there was an exhibition by Ai Weiwei, the great Chinese artist, Mm -hmm. and it shows one of his famous, famous uh, works of art. It's kind of a work of art. He takes a valuable Ming vase that's 2,000 years old and breaks it, drops it on the floor. And it was his way of drawing attention to what happened during the Cultural Revolution in China when there was a great deal of destruction of old, very much like what happened in Mali, where they were destroying old cultural property. So this is a a video of him. He buys legally this this very expensive vase, and and he just throws it down and breaks it, and he says, how do you feel about that? He's making a statement. Wow. And the problem is that's not covered by the Rome Statute, that sort of thing. That's The Rome Statute is, is, is very inadequate, and it's going to be very hard to prosecute those cases. So there's a lot more work that needs to be done developing the legal framework here in order to uh, address these problems. Well, let's turn to Shannon French. So you're the author of a book called The Code of the Warrior, which is now coming out in a second edition. That's right. It adds a whole chapter in, in mm-hmm. Al-Qaeda in this whole area, right? That's right. Um, so <laughs> you've studied military behavior. You know how the military thinks. If they give this guy the 9 to 11 years that the prosecutor is asking for, or even less, do you think that that's going to have a deterrent effect on others, militants in Syria and Iraq and around the world? I mean, first of all, as as a scholar, like most of us, when I hear about the destruction of irreplaceable texts, for example, I mean, I think that the punishment is much too weak and it should be, uh, you know, something medieval. Uh, but mm. uh, but in any case, the answer is no. Genuinely, I don't think deterrence is, is the key goal here, but it never has been in the prosecution of war crimes, not the key goal. The key goal is to reaffirm our own values and try to continue to build the international consensus around what is unacceptable. This has been one of the most fascinating broadcasts we have, and I'm sorry to say we're coming to the end of our time. Paul Williams, Mark Ellis, Bill Chavis, Melina Stereo, and Shannon French, thank you all so much for providing your insights on art, diplomacy, and accountability. I'm Michael Scharf, 
You've been listening to Talking Foreign Policy. Talking Foreign Policy is a production of Case Western Reserve University and is produced in partnership with 90.3 FM WCPN Idea Stream. Questions and comments about the topics discussed on the show or to suggest future topics, go to talkingforeignpolicy at case.edu. That's talkingforeignpolicy, all one word, at case.edu. Thank you.